But when did the crisis with our boys begin in earnest? Well, it really began probably in the 60s when when there was more and more of an increase in focus on on women's issues. And we were sort of doing a zero sum game. We were saying that, you know, that boys were part of the problem. Boys were the oppressors. And this came out of, you know, the, um, the we in the women's movement. I say we in the women's movement because I was very much a part of the women's movement, movement at that time. And we'd come through, you know, the civil rights movement and in which there was an oppressor and an oppressed group. And the, uh, many of the early feminists were Marxist in their tendencies. And they were in Marxism. It was sort of like there's an oppressor and an oppressed. And that hierarchical assumption that somebody has to be on top and somebody's on the bottom, we took that into women's issues and, and, and said that, you know, women were the oppressed and men were the oppressors. And that left, and then we said masculinity is toxic and that toxicity comes from male privilege. Well, it is true that there's a lot of parts of masculinity that are toxic, just like there are a lot of parts of femininity that are toxic. Uh, but the toxicity of masculinity does not come from male privilege. It comes from the the price that men paid by having to cut off from their feelings in order to be disposable in war and be willing to be the ones to go out and be killed. And, and each generation had its war. And we were we told men you were needed and you needed to be drafted and you need to register for the draft. Even today, you need to register for the draft if you're a male, but not a female. And so males learn that if you're going to if you're going to serve that purpose, uh, being worth worthwhile, you're going to either be willing to risk disposability in war or disposability in the workplace in the most hazardous jobs, for example. And this, but in order to be dis- willing to be disposable and think of yourself as a hero um, by possibly giving up your life, you had to disconnect from your feelings of hurt and pay- of pain, of, of sensitivity. And that created a set of problems of not being able to say what's going on inside of you. And so there were lots of male toxicities, but they didn't emanate from male privilege. They emanated from the price that men paid in order to feel like they would be able to get loved. They know that men noticed that women fell in love uh, with, you know, not the uh, not not the um, private and the pacifist, um, but the, you know, the the soldier um, and the person that was was quite the opposite of the private and the pacifist, if you will, the officer and the gentleman. Mm. Oh, that's so interesting. One of the things you said reminded me of um, it's a Dr. Phil line, but I I loved it, and it it goes as follows: How can you win when the person you love most is losing? You know, fights between women and men, uh, the search for women to get ahead in the workplace and sort of equal out their position in America at writ large. How can we win when the guys we want to love and do love are losing? It's not a zero sum game. It can't it can't be zero sum. As you know, I do couples communication workshops. And one of the things I ask every couple to do and, you know, understand in the couples workshops, some people are there just to enhance their marriage or relationship and others are on the verge of divorce or have already filed for divorce. So it's a, l- a large group of people, diff- different group of people. And one of the questions I ask is to write down uh, something, the answer to a question that your partner will never see. Um, and I make sure that that happens, uh, that they don't see it. And, um, and the question is, if your, if your partner was to be on the verge of dying and you knew with a hundred percent certainty your partner was going to die, um, and yet you could, um, you, you knew that with a hundred percent certainty that you could save your partner's life. However, you'd take a 50% chance of risking or losing your own life in the process. Would you do it or not? Yes. No. Uncertain. 90 some odd percent of the men, usually about 95 percent of the men, even though some of them are get, thinking about a divorce, um, say that they would risk their lives at the 50 percent level to save their partner's lives. About 85 percent of the women say the same thing about the men. And in, among gay couples, it's pretty much the same um, ratio. And yet, so I, so my first step in, in mindsets that I ask people to do in order to, before they lis- listen to their partner's criticism is to say, if I'm willing to die to give my partner life, maybe I could listen to give my partner life. Mm. And that's one of six meditations I ask people to go for, be, to uh, go to, um, to do. 
before they hear their partner's criticism of them, realizing that when you provide a safe environment for your partner's concern or criticism, you're giving them life and you're also guarantee- doing what I call a love guarantee. You're guaranteeing that your partner will feel safe when she or he says whatever they want to say in whatever way they want to say it, exaggerating, not telling the same story that you would tell. And when they feel completely heard, they feel safe by you. Therefore, they feel more loved by you. And therefore, they feel more love for you. And it's exactly what you were saying a minute ago, these, that you know, when we love somebody so much, what is there about us that can't hear their complaint? And what there is about us that can't hear their complaints or their criticism is that historically and biologically, when there was a complaint or a criticism about us, it was a potential enemy. And so biologically, we were prepared to become defensive when we heard an enemy criticize us mm. um, because defenses were our way of surviving. However, they're the while they're helpful for survival in the past, they're not helpful for love in the future. How big, and I want to get into more of the couple stuff later, for sure, I find it all fascinating, but how big a role has men's presence outside the home as the typically the historical uh, primary wage earner played in this? I don't even know what toxic masculinity is exactly. You know, I, I can think of one example of it in my life. I mean, I'm, uh, there have been more, but I'll give you one example that I know was a toxic masculine moment. Beyond that, I don't really understand it. Um, I was a young lawyer. I was in my 20s. I bumped into a guy from college. I went to Syracuse University. And he was like, oh, you're a lawyer? I'm like, yeah, I'm a lawyer. He's like, oh, good for you. He's like, I, I never I never expected you to wind up you know, doing something like that. I'm like, oh, well, thanks. Yeah, it's working out fine. He's like, what firm are you with? And I happen to be with one of the best firms in the country. So there's no way around acknowledging you know, it was a great firm. And he's like, oh, good for you. It's nice. Go make me a sandwich. And he walked away. So he's a jerk, wow. right? The guy's, the guy's a jerk. And I would definitely say that's toxically masculine, I guess, under the, sort of the loose term, that, the way it's used today, where you're just sort of like a douchey guy putting down a woman um, in a way that seems based on gender or sex roles and so on. Anyway, I don't really understand the term, but I do wonder, to your point about years of going to war and years of being the one to have to sacrifice and risk physically, sort of the, the other piece of that is, years of having to be the one out of the house and not really around the children as much and not, you know, and having the re- responsibility of being the nurturer at home. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think a lot, a lot of, I think a lot of men do do things that, you know, even they would look back on and say were, were not <laughs> appropriate or not, you know, not, not, not conducive. And one of the things that I used to do is a couple of, I used to do, um, role reversal dates and men's beauty contests. And so I would say every woman is in a, in a beauty contest every day of her life. And so um, I'll, if men here in the audience would like to understand what women go through as being part of that beauty contest in everyday life, I'll ask every single man in the audience to come up on the stage and in the aisles and to be part of that beauty contest of everyday life uh, that women go through. And so I would then have all the women be the judges. And so the uh, women would ask, um, so so the the guys at the end of the process, um, there would be six finalists and then finally a a winner. And the the guy who was the winner would almost always say some version of, this is interesting. I'm so proud of being a winner. And for the last, you know, hour, I competed fiercely to, to get this accolade of being a winner. And yet the questions that have been asked of me are making me feel like, they're they're not tapping into my values, my intelligence, my thoughtfulness, my caring. They're just you know they're just I'm being looked at as a body, and um, and I, that feels really um, bad to me. Even though I've competed to be part of that, mm-hmm. um, and so when the women heard that, they'd go, "Yes, thank you." Um, and I'd say, "But remember, this is a role reversal experience. So I'm going to ask now the women." Uh, to experience what men go through. And so, first of all, I'd ask the women to sit in seats and rows according to how much money they predicted that they would be making in the future. Then I'd okay. ask the guys to focus on um, the women who earned the most money so that their children would have the most options in the best schools, the best neighborhoods, and so on. And to not just put their eyes on the women in the back rows who are on average more attractive, interestingly. And so the 
the, the guys um, tried to, you know, I really had to work hard to get the guys to do that. And finally, um, I'd ask the women to sort of focus on the, the body that you'd most be interested in to really tune into the guys' bodies. But of course, because the men had been through that men's beauty contest, uh, they all had an, an hour of training to tune into the guys' bodies. And so then the women came up and they tried to compete for the man that was was most attractive uh, to them. And oftentimes the most attractive men, the finalists in the beauty contest, had seven, eight, nine women uh, that were competing to be their date for the evening. And so um, at the end of that process, I'd ask the women to talk about their experiences and they'd say, this is amazing. Whenever I've used the word in the past, used the word jerk, I would use it for a man. But today I came up and I was wanting to ask Bill or whatever out. And there were seven other women competing with me. So I started saying, you know, Bill, you're going to really love going out in my Porsche. And I'm going to take you to this restaurant, which I've never been to, but I heard it was the best restaurant in town. I can't afford it. But I was exaggerating what I had. I don't have a Porsche. I was exaggerating where I would take him to, which I couldn't afford. And then when when I had it narrowed down to two or three women and I still wasn't winning, I took the guy by the arm and pulled him away uh, with me. Uh, so I uh, and and did something that if a guy did that to me, I would consider that sexual harassment or some version of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I did it to him. I was like such a jerk. Um, and now I'm getting to I'm getting the the cue that you know that that being that toxic male, being that jerk, was oftentimes uh, what I did to compensate for my insecurity to be able to not get rejected. And the guys would go, "Oh, thank you. That is what so frequently being a jerk is about." Um, doing something that is tr I'm trying to do to minimize rejection. But in the process of doing it, I oftentimes increase my poss possibility of being rejected. So everyone's starting to go back to school right now, right? And over the next few weeks, you have an opportunity right now to do good by helping feed children who are facing hunger and food insecurity. Our partner, Good Ranchers, is on a mission to donate 100,000 high quality meals to young children who often go unfed or are malnourished from poor access to nutritious food. You can join this campaign by ordering a box of 100% American meat. Every order contributes meals to this cause and makes a huge difference in the lives of these children. Why wouldn't you do it, right? You get an amazing meal for your family and you help children who are hurting in the process. Good Ranchers is an award-winning food delivery service that brings 100% American meat and seafood to your door. They source the best of American farms so that you can get the highest quality food possible and trust what you're feeding your family every time. Go to goodranchers.com slash Megan to join the movement today. You will get $30 off your order. You'll get free shipping and you will donate food to kids in need. Giving back never felt or tasted so good. Let's help them hit and pass their goal of 100,000 meals donated. Go to goodranchers.com slash Megan or use that code Megan at checkout. Change the future one meal at a time with Good Ranchers. Goodranchers.com slash Megan. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.